Welcome to the International Sunday School lesson for Sunday, July 16, 2022. The title of this lesson and voice commentary, as well as Towson's Press International Sunday School commentary is The Soar and the Seed. Hey, if you enjoy our lessons, please let us know by liking, commenting, subscribing, and hitting the little bell to be notified when we post each week. To find out more about Jordan Christian Center, a virtual ministry aiming to transform lives by equipping, educating, empowering, as well as encouraging the world, please visit us at jordanchristiancenter.com. Hey, I'm Minister Adam, and Sunday School is now in session. And before we get into our lesson, let's start with a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we ask that you be with us as we go through your word, Lord. Help us to glean an understanding from your word, Lord, so we can live uh, the holy life that you expect from us, Lord. Help us to understand your way and lean not on our own understanding. Lord, we love you, honor you, and we praise you. In your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's get into our lesson. Our scripture will be coming from Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. Then we'll go over to 18 through 23, and we'll be in the New King James Bible, version of the Bible. Then the main thought comes from Matthew chapter 13, verse 23, which says, But he who receives seed on good grounds is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bear fruits and produces some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. Now, as we do each week, we'll start with a little bit of background. We're now in the seventh lesson of the new unit that's titled, Jesus Envisions the Kingdom. This week's lesson is coming once again from the book of Matthew. Now, the Gospel of Matthew is tr a traditionally a credit to the Apostle Matthew, um, and he's also known as Matthew the Tax Collector. This gospel was to a Christian audience who was either Jewish or highly familiar with the Jewish religion based on how he's writing, how he doesn't cover any of the Jewish concepts. In fact, you'll find in his writing, um, it is as if they should already know the law. So he compares the law to the new covenant with Christ. Now, Matthew presents Jesus as the Messiah. The, the promised descendant of King J David, who will bring God's kingdom to earth and establish a time of both peace and justice. The Gospel of Matthew discussed the lineage, birth, and early life of Jesus Christ in the first two chapters. From there, the book discussed the ministry of Jesus. Now, the, the, the descriptions of Christ Jesus' uh, teachings we find in Matthew is kind of arranged in what we would call discourses, such as the Sermon on the Mount, what we find in chapter 5 through 7. Or in chapter 10, it involved the mission and purpose of his disciples. And 13 is a collection of parables. In fact, we'll be discussing one of the parables in chapter 13 today. Chapter 18 discusses the church. Chapter 23, it begins this discourse be uh, between hypocrisy as well as the future. Chapter 21 and 27, it actually goes into detail about the arrest, the torture, and the execution of our Lord Jesus Christ. But finally, in, in that final chapter, it discussed the resurrection as well as the great commission that Jesus gave the disciples. Now, Matthew quotes the Old Testament extensively. And he placed particular emphasis on Jesus fulfilling the prophecies that was foretold in the Old Testament, which means that the audience had to be familiar with the Old Testament. And that's how we come to the conclusion that his audience must have either been Jewish or familiar with Jewish customs. See, Matthew tells the story of Jesus with an emphasis on his role as the Messiah, or the Christ. He shows us that Jesus is the Son of God, that he's conceived by the Holy Spirit in Mary's womb, that Jesus is the King. He's the Son of David, which means he's from the bloodline of David, which means Jesus reigned in both heaven as well as earth by all the principal measures that anyone could measure a king. It's shown that Jesus is the promised Savior. It's shown how his lineage is from the, uh, from the line of Abraham, to whom God had promised to be a blessing to all the nations on earth. And that's what we find the seed of Abraham leads all the way up through Christ. And now we know Christ as our Lord and Savior. Therefore, we can say Abraham's seed um, leads to Christ. And God fulfilled his promise by being a blessing to all nations. 
Now, leading up to our lesson, what we find is a huge group of people follow Jesus um, from the overcrowded house that he was teaching in from the end of chapter uh, 12. So he went out from there to the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Now, so many key people gathered around Jesus at that time that he, he, they couldn't see and hear him. So to solve this problem, Jesus get um, in a boat, sits on uh, a bit off the shore, and, and the crowd stands around on the beach shores to listen as he, he began to tell them the parable that we're going to go over today. Now, here's the thing. Parables, brothers and sisters, are usually short stories designed to emphasize a greater truth. The main purpose of a, a parable is to make a larger abstract idea easier for someone to grasp. By relating something that's more common experience from a human perspective, parable makes a deeper um, concept more accessible to people, make them understand it. See, parables aren't simply some kind of cute, clever way of Jesus teaching moral or ethical truth. They are an expression in a service, as a, they serve as an announcement of the kingdom of God. So Christ used earthly symbolism to show kingdom truths. That's what a parable is. And this is where our lesson begins today in Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, which says, On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. A great multitude were gathered together to him. So he had got into a boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. He then spoke things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. Here we find Jesus commonly used parables, which again are short stories with earthly metaphors for kingdom ramifications. See, this parable begins with Jesus changing locations before speaking. He left the house, sit on the boat at the seashore. Now, one of the reasons he might have done this is because the house was too small and he had a multitude of followers. But what we do find is Jesus frequently sat by the seashore. Even when he, he, he met many of his disciples by the seashore. Now, this is probably because, I don't know if you know this or not, but water is a great amplifier. Sounds travel faster in water compared to the air because the water particles are packed more densely. So when Jesus spoke um, on, on the sea, the multitude could hear him loud and clear. So in this case, he began to tell the parable of the sower. In the sea. Now, the listeners here would immediately identify to what Jesus was talking about because many of them was farmers. They know about planting seed and seed growing, and, and, and if it's not the right soil, the seed wouldn't grow. So Jesus is about to tell this parable, and they will completely understand the earthly meaning. Jesus only had to then interpret that or give the ramifications of that from a heavenly perspective. So in this lesson, we're not going to just go chronologically in these verses. We're going to bring some verses together. Let me explain. Verses 4 through 9 give this earthly metaphor of the sower and the seed. But verses 18 through 23 give the kingdom ramifications of this earthly metaphor. So we're going to combine these verses with the, uh, the earthly metaphor with the heavenly ramifications as we go through the lessons today. So we're going to start with verse nine, uh, 4, and that ties in to the heavenly ramifications in verse 19. So let's begin. Verse 4 says, as, as he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. The heavenly ramification in chapter, I'm sorry, in verse 19 says, anyone who hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is he who received the seed by the wayside. So here Jesus tells them about a, a, a seed that falls by the wayside and what that means from a heavenly realm. So as we get into this lesson, it's very important to note a couple of things. Number one, all the seeds that Jesus are talking about here is the same. So at no point are we talking about the problem with the seed growing being the seed itself. There's no difference in the seed. 
The other thing is the person dropping the seed in this case will be Jesus, our Savior. But we will be the ones dropping the seed um, right now. And the seed we'll find is the word of God. But we do it by sharing. Jesus shared himself. We share Jesus with others. That's how we drop seeds. So now that we got those two things out of the way, let's dive in. Jesus says some of the seeds fell by the wayside. This seed did not fertilize all because the hardness of the soil. It wasn't a seed. It was the soil. This, this is a, uh, when we bring this to, to humans, this soil being us, this is a hardened individual who did not respond to the word of God. The first illustration is about the receptiveness to where there's no positive decision to God's word at all. The first situation is where the seed fell, where the, 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 the soil was so packed down by traffic that it didn't penetrate. So, for example, sometimes we may give the word to somebody and they're so hurt. They're so broken in life that they just won't believe it. It just they will not take what you say at all. Remember, it's not the word that you're saying. They're not ready to receive the word. And this Jesus is using a metaphor of the seed falling by the wayside. Then when we look at verse 19, Jesus transcribed um, verse 4 from kingdom terms. Jesus interpreted the birds, these will represent Satan. The soil, the sower is God himself. And the seed is the word of God. The wayside actually um, signified the word. So let's, let's dive into what that means. Today, we're the one dropping the seed. So we're the sower. However, God is the creator of the seed. So we're the one dropping God's word. The, the, the seed, again, being brought God's word, his truth, and nothing but the truth. This shows us that, that we're not to shove the word down someone's throat. We're not to throw the Bible at them. No, we're simply to share the word. And if their heart's receptive, we'll find as these different souls will represent, then they will receive the word. But we're simply... Droppers, we drop the seed, and the rooting of that seed is all about the person that's here. That the, the, we are to share the word. Now, the understanding of the word, of the hearer, we'll find that some will, some won't. We got to take on this, this, this understanding that some will, some won't. So what? Who, can, who else can we give the word to? We, we've done what God had called us to do. Jesus' great commission to us as believers is to go out and share the word. And we go out and share. But guess what? Some people will not respond to. The business of the believer is to sow the seed. In other words, drop the seed. The obligation of the world is to receive or reject it. They have the same choice that we have. If they reject it, this is the example that Jesus gives us here of the seed falling by the wayside. The person refused. It, it, they have, it, it's no reflection on us. It's just they have a hardened heart. This are seeds that fall by the wayside. Now, as we move down to verses 5 and 6, which ties into verses 20 and 21, it gives us our, the next type of soil. It gives us the earthly metaphor along with the heavenly ramifications. Let's read it. Verse 5 and 6 says, some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprung up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. The heavenly ramification is described in verse 20 and 21, which read, but he who hears the seed on stony places this is he who hears the word and immediately received it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself because endures only for a while. For when turbulations and persecution arrive because of the word, immediately he stumbles. So here, the seed in this case, it lands on stony soil, or stony places. Stony places is where the soil is thin. Lying upon a rocky shelf. When the, when the soil, uh, when the seed hit the soil, it springs up quickly. Why? Because the warmth of the soil helps it germinate very quickly. Because the, the, the um, soil is warmer because rock retains the heat from the sun. But 
The seed is unlikely to take root because of the rocky soil. So it's a surface seed, so to speak, but it springs up. This represents someone who give their life to Christ and they're on fire. Matter of fact, if we bring it today, this would be someone that, that, that give their life to Christ and, and, and say they love Christ. They join every ministry in the church. They have church every day of the week and, and, and it, because they're refreshed and in, in the newness of God. But we find verse 21 describe what happens next. See, this new Christian seemed to immediately, it, it says they immediately understand and accept the truth of our Lord and Savior. But their earthly growth is, is, is only so rich. It is only so much. So when the persecution and the difficult circumstances come in, in this case, it's talking about like the sun scorching this plant. Only those who have their root, who are rooted, that has water and support can survive hardship. It doesn't take much for any of us to imagine the hardship and persecution that we face as Christian. This is talking about a person that's on fire at first, but as soon as the tribulation comes, as soon as, as persecution comes, they wither away. This person is excited at the idea of God, but they don't, they're not rooted. They don't have enough word and, and enough under, own, uh, of understanding of the word. So they, when times get rough, well, their own desires get going. Their own understanding get going. The trials expose what they truly believe. And, 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 they, and it shows that they're merely emotional about Christ. They, they might have reflected on their life and how much they need, but it was all emotion. It wasn't in their soul. They didn't truly understand that we walk by faith and not by sight. They, there was no true commitment to Christ. So when pressure came, it, they quickly fell away from Christ uh, uh, and seeing him as Messiah, we call this backsliding, where they just fall away. They, they figure they can do better on their own. If they're going to have problems, hey, why serve God at the same time? This is a type of soil that Jesus is talking about here, where someone is only so deep in Christ. This is a person that they're not reading the word. They're, they're not studying and meditating on the word. They, they, they may go to church on Sunday, but that's it. That one hour or two hours is the only word they get. And that's not enough to sustain us. When the, when the midnight hour comes, we need Christ. We need to be rooted in Christ. This type of seed is not rooted. So the enemy can cause them to back away from it with trials and tribulations. Matter of fact, common phrases you will hear from this soul is, if God loved me, why would he allow this to happen? So God must not be real. That, that's what they would come up with their understanding. Or they believe that uh, they can work their way through life instead of faithing their way through life. That if they work hard and they do everything um, that, uh, based on what they think is right, then they'll be okay. They'll go to heaven. They should live the good life. But how many millionaires are still depressed? How many people that you would think would be happy because they have all these worldly material and still have no joy? Because joy comes from the Lord. But when we're not rooted in that, we try everything but God. See, this soil or person really sometimes has these unrealistic expectations. Perhaps this unrealistic expectation is they believe that once they give their life to Christ and they're on fire for God, that trouble should not come their way anymore as a Christian. Here's the thing. When that happens and, and life hits them and find out we still suffer, there's still persecution, they're disappointed. How many know that disappointment is a powerful emotion? In some cases the, uh, cases, the trouble to which Jesus referred to may have existed in their life before they even um, gave their life to Christ. They might have had pre-existing problems with family, pre-existing problems with certain addictions, and they thought that as soon as they give their life to Christ, that it would magically disappear. And dissolution is the result of that. So they say, I'll just do it my way from now on. The person's face falter in these circumstances, and it reveals a lack of roots. If you're struggling with your faith right now, how deep is your roots? How, how are, are you studying your word? Are you meditating on your word? Do you have the relationship we need with Christ? You ever wonder, when you go to the tropics, you find a lot of palm trees. 
One thing about a palm tree versus like an oak tree and, and, and pine trees like we find here in the States, so cooler climates, is a palm tree bends. So when the wind comes, when the hurricane comes, it bends. And because your roots are in the ground, they may bend, but they won't break. This is what we need to be able to thrive in our Christianity. When trouble comes, we'll be rooted enough in God. So we bend, but we won't break. And that only comes by placing our trust in God and God alone. The next story will be found in verse 7, and the heavenly ramifications will be found in verse 22, the third soil. It reads, And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. The kingdom ramification is found in verse 22, which says, Now he who receives seeds among the thorns is he, is he who hear the word, and the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. Again, we have to note here with this soil, it's so, uh, the, the soil is fertile enough for the seed to grow, but it's a bad environment for the seed to grow among thorns. So they get the word in them. They begin to, uh, in this case, the seed will germinate and grow for a while, but then the thorns eventually choke the growth and the seed dies. This is a person in this particular parable is talking about a, a believer who initially respond to the word, but let the cares of the world choke out the message of God. See, worrying will crowd out the word. Worrying is a great enemy to a believer because anxiety begins to set in and, and people have this inverted scale of values for money control their choices. The pursuit of happiness or materialistic happiness, it's, it, it, it controls their, their, their choices. These are people who don't who try to mix the word with the world. But the reality is we can't mix the word with the world at all. We either going to have faith or we're going to have fear. So to Christians that try to live like this, we find they're not very productive in their Christian life. Therefore, they don't bear fruit. You find sometimes they may have been a Christian for 20 and 30 years, but they still need the milk. They're not ready for the meat yet because they won't grow anymore because they won't remove themselves from the thorns and the cares of this world. We are, God, God said we are set apart. That's what it means to be holy, which means we need to be set apart from those things of the world. And when we don't do that, the thorns or the cares of the world chokes out our faith and our growth. See, the word of God becomes crowded out in this situation. And it's easy to let the details of life crowd out what's most important. Thorns represent the love of the world over Jesus. But Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 through 34, he says, So do not worry, saying, what should we eat and what shall we drink and what shall we work? For the pagans run around after all these things, and your heavenly Father know that you need them. But seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow's worry about itself. Each day have enough trouble in its own. Here's what happens. When we worry about tomorrow, we can't focus on Christ. Because Christ already know what tomorrow will bring. By the time we get to tomorrow, it's too late. It becomes today. But Christ already know what's happening tomorrow. So why do we worry about tomorrow? And when we worry about tomorrow, we call that anxiety. It's called, we're worrying about what to eat, what we're going to drink, what we're going to work. When Christ says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added, meaning that God is the provider of these things anyway. Our worrying will not help us, not one bit, but it will take our focus off Christ and it will stunt our growth. It will become the thorns. The enemy can choke the life out of our faith due to us worrying about what Jesus has already overcome, which is the world and everything in it. So we're either going to be faithful or fearful. Note that we only one of those things can be fulfilled in our life. 
we can be full of faith or we're going to be full of fear because together they do not exist. In fact, if we look at Revelation chapter 6, verse 16, Jesus says, I can take you hot or cold, but if you're lukewarm, I will spit you out. Meaning we can't straddle the fence. He requires us to make a choice. Now, as we move down to the last um, seed uh, or last type of soil here, we'll be looking at verses 8 and 9 and then get the kingdom ramification from verse 23. They read, but others fall on good ground and yield a crop, some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And the kingdom ramification is found and described in verse 23, which says, but he who received the seed on good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. See, as the seed fall on good soil, it produces a good crop. It bears fruit. It grows. It multiplies. That's what happens to, to, to the righteous. We, we, we're able to spread God's love around. We're able to spread the word around better because we're following the master. Now, these are the people who respond rightly to the word. They bear fruit. This soil represents those who receive the word. And fruit comes out. In other words, they grow in God. They are rooted and they grow in God. Addictions they had fall off. Um, certain issues they have, they don't have anymore. The attitude changes. They have growth. They don't get mad as quick. They, they Their family recognize that this is just not the same person anymore because they start to produce the fruits of the Spirit. See, the seed in, of the word need to be implanted in the soul where there's a hunger to understand the word. A commitment to developing the spiritual root through all the means of grace available to us is a fierce resistant to the encroachment of materialistic and worldly cares. What, what does that mean? That means that when the soil hit good ground, we can't get enough of God. Sunday is great because we want to hear the word, but we are in the word for ourselves. We want to hear what God has to say. We're on our knees praying daily because the Bible tells us to pray continuously. We're praying daily because we want that continual feedback from God. We have a, we meditate on the word so the word can get in us. So we don't even have to open up the scripture. The word is embedded in our heart. That is what it means to be rooted in God. So the winds and the storms of life blow. We might bend because we are human. However, we won't break. Our faith will remain, knowing that God will do what he say he would do. That is the good ground that Christ wants the seed to fall upon. See, brothers and sisters, we're called to be, uh, to have a cultivated life. This involves regularly reading scripture and prayer, reflection and self-examination, confession our sins, giving thanksgiving, conversing with other Christians, and, and works of grace that, that make our corner of the world better. The people around them should feel better when they're around us because they know we're not going to lie to them. We're not going to cheat them. We're not going to rob them. We're going to deal fairly with them. And even in those times when they wrong us, we're going to do what Jesus said and still love them. We make the world around us better because we share, reflect the light of Christ in this world and we're set apart. This soul represents a person that's sold out for God. They desire to, to have a deeper root in God and a better alignment with his word. God here is the sower. sower. We are the seed. God, as a sower, determined the yield. Every divine act of sowing seed in our life comes from the gracious heart of God. God is entrusting this gift to us in hopes that we will do our part for seed growth and development so it can bear fruit. What does that mean? That when we give our life to Christ and we read his word, God develop us. Our good works are in because of Christ. Uh, you, we know faith without works is dead. So we understand that because of our faith, 
We do the works. We do what God requires of us and God allow us to bear fruit. The yield that God grants depends on how God is able to use us. If blessing does not flow through us, it stops with us, why would God continue blessing us? Why would God continue to, to do things for us when it stops with us? The goal is to give it away, give away the word, share and, and work in our community and do what God so his light can be reflected. God's blessings won't run out because it continue to flow through us. So the seed should make us think about the possibilities when we look at it. The question is, what type of seed are you? Is the seed, is the word falling on good ground with you? Do you desire to get closer and closer to God? Or are you like the uh, first seed where you are on fire for Christ, but right now you, you don't have time for God. You don't even have time to go to church. Sometimes we need to check out soil. So in conclusion, brothers and sisters, we can rest assured that there will be some people that reject our message. This is really what Jesus is, is, is telling us here. Some people won't get it. We're to tell it. We're to give the word of God to people, but some people won't take it. So all you pastors, Sunday school lesson um, teachers, parachurch worker, who sometimes become discouraged due to the lack of response of, of your message, our God predicted that there will be different kinds of purposes for the message, that some will get it and some won't. And the reality is, it's not our responsibility to guarantee the response. We are to give the word. God is the one that can change the soil in which the word fall upon. Um, Paul mentioned that some sow, some water, and God gets the increase. So for all of you out there that might have been talking to your family members about God for a long time, and they're still out there, or talking to friends and other people, and they're still out there, that's nothing against you. They're just not ready. But in due time, when they're ready, when their soul is right, don't tell them I told you so. Give them the word again, because we know faith comes by hearing. Amen. Brothers and sisters, until next week, May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord first face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn towards you and give you peace. I'm Minister Adam, and you have a blessed week.